Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Zachwa, and this is your brother, Kasifo. We thank you and we greet you as always in the name of Ahaya, in the name of Yache, our Dono, and our Savior. We have a great lesson today. This is another lesson going along with the women's series, but this lesson in itself isn't only for the women. This lesson is for men as well. So um, especially all of these lessons in the women's series, men can definitely check them out because there are definitely some jewels in all of them, and it's for everybody but more so targeting the women um, to help them along with their walks. Um, this lesson is grabbing hold of contentment. And let's get started. You want to say hello, everybody, Kasa, before we get going? <laughs> Peace be with you all. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. All right. We have to be content in all things so that we may, may be of a sound mind, as 2 Timothy 1 and 7 states. We can't allow our own wants to lead us, whether it be our desires, how we feel something should be, or how something should go, or what we feel we should have. When we signed up to follow Yache, we agreed that his will be done, giving up the right of our own. And that's the battle of contentment with the decision we made and the calling by which we are called. Kassin, can we read Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, so that we can see how Elohim has called us to be? Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So Elohim wants us to choose. And you may ask, what does this have to do with contentment, right? Let's keep reading. Let's see what Elohim speaks about as he continues going on. Go ahead, Brother Casa. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Right. So the things that we esteem as prosperous in our own self-will and desires are worthless to Elohim. Now, what does Elohim esteem as prosperous? Right? Because he said, because we say that we are rich. Right? We increase with our goods. So we have more. We're growing. We're prospering. And have need of nothing. We don't need anything. Everything is a want for us because we have everything that we need, right? As far as this man, this mindset of this person. So what does Elohim esteem as prosperous? Keep on reading, Brother Kasa. Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Everybody knows the scripture that um, we're supposed to be as gold tried in the fire, right? And was it Sarat? Mm -hmm. So he's actually talking about us, that we are supposed to come to him as gold tried in the fire. We're supposed to be refined because when gold goes into the fire, it's refined. It's made pure. So he would rather that we be pure than for us to feel that we're prosperous by the things that we have. Go ahead, Brother Cotton. that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see verse 19 as many as i love i rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent 
He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Right? So, if you can understand what Elohim is actually talking about. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye slaves that thou mayest see. Now, all of these things that he's actually talking about and referring to are the things that come with time. That's why he said, as many as I love, I rebuke. So it's actually him that's actually chastening you and actually purifying you over time through the different circumstances or instances that a person may go through. He said, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So when he brings it to you, when he brings something to you, or he takes you through something and you learn something, he actually wants you to learn from it and repent from what you were doing that was wrong. Uh, now, can we go to Barnabas 19 and 6 so we can understand that all of these things that come upon us actually come from Elohim, and it's actually to teach us or to further us in our walk. Barnabas 19 and 6. The accidents that befall thee, thou shalt receive as good, knowing that nothing is done without Elohim. All right. So the accidents that befall you, the things that just so happen to happen to you, receive it as good. Don't receive it as, all oh, the devil is attacking me, or oh, all these bad things keep happening to me, and I don't understand why. Allah is doing it to you. And he's doing it to you for the purpose of you to actually learn from it so that you can stop doing something that's actually injuring you. That's why he wants you to repent from it. And it, it ties in with contentment, as you're going to see further on in the lesson, that it's just going to come all together. And you're going to see how important contentment is for someone who's walking in the faith. Brother Kassan, can we go back to Revelation 3 and go to verse 20 and start from there? Sure. Revelations 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So as we're going to continue reading, that's we're going to keep on going to other verses and other Hebrew scriptures, it's going to start making more and more sense. It's going to be more evident. He said, behold, I stand at the door. Now, we're the temple, right? Because our body is the temple. And Elohim is standing at the door trying to get into our temple. So that means that something is prohibiting him or blocking him from coming into the door of our temple. Right? Now, he says, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking. He's waiting on us to answer. If any man hear my voice and open the door. So first you got to hear his voice for you to open the door, right? It's gonna get very interesting if we continue on with this lesson and you're gonna start understanding what's actually playing against you and against all of us, actually. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So he wants you to open the door and he wants you to let him in so that he can inhabit you, so that he can sup with you and you with him, so that y'all can dine together and dwell with one another, right? Continue going, Brother Casa. Verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. So hold on. What are you overcoming? Now, something was stopping you from opening the door, and you had to hear his voice in order to know it's him to open the door. And then he says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. So there's something that is prohibiting you from actually opening the door and overcoming. And we're going to get to it. Keep on going, Brother Casa. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Oh. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Right. So we're going to come back to that part, right? So just in a nutshell, 
Many of us are not seeing the blessings that we have, but only seeing the things that you're lacking and don't have or not good at. So that causes a lack of contentment. Or we're struggling to cease from sins because self-will and pride, which also causes another lack of contentment. And or the law becomes null and void when faced with the decision to gain, whether it be money or something of profit to you. So in that moment, you may negate the law to get what you want. Um, Brother Costa, can we get the definition in the Greek? We're going to get the definition of content in the Greek and the Hebrew. The definition in the Greek, G714, apparently from a primary verb, through the idea of raising a barrier. Properly to ward off, that is, by implication, to avail. Figuratively, be satisfactory. Be content, be enough, suffice, be sufficient. All right. Let me touch on that one before you go to the next one, please. Uh, it says, through the idea of raising a barrier. So the barrier, we're going to say the barrier is food and raiment, right? And we're going to read the scriptures on it. Let's say the barrier is like, I have food and raiment. I'm content with that. Anything else? It's a plus. If Allah Hayyam deems to give me anything more than that, it's great, but I don't desire it. You set a barrier, right? Properly to ward off. So all the thoughts that come to you about, hey, oh, that would be great to have, or whatever the case is, you ward those off because you already set your barrier. Food and raiment, I'm content. Now, anything else, if Allah Hayyam gives it to me, Great, praise the higher for it, but I'm not desiring it. So you ward it off, all right? That is by implication to avail. So you're actually availing over the desire or the temptation, right? So be content, be enough, suffice, be sufficient, all right? Uh, go ahead with the Hebrew, Brother Casa. The Hebrew is H2974, a primitive root through the idea of mental weakness, properly to yield, especially assent, hence positively to undertake as an act of volition. Assay, begin, be content, please take upon willingly would. Now, this says, a primary root, probably rather the same as H2973, through the idea of mental weakness. That's a very interesting thing because to not be content means that you're mentally weak, according to the definition. Because it says properly to yield. So if you're mentally weak, you can't yield yourself. You can't stop yourself from going after desire or going after a temptation. That's why it says, especially assent, hence positively, then it switches to a positive side of content where those were negative. It says to undertake as an act of volation. That means that you endure something. A say, begin, content, please take upon willingly. So you take it upon willingly because you're staying in your contentment. Now, when we, when we were talking about in Revelations about knocking on the door and that something already has to be in your temple for you to not answer the door or to recognize the voice, right? Now, we're going to go over a brief synopsis, then we're going to actually go into the scriptures. There are two angels with every man. Everybody has two angels that's with them. And which both of them are trying to convince you. They're both literally trying to get you to hear their voice. Many of our thoughts are not our own. 
for these two angels are at war with one another, fighting for your cooperation. Seeing which inclination your soul is going to agree with. That's why you'll hear people say they hear voices in their head. If a person isn't concrete in their ways, these two angels warn will have mental effects on a weaker mind. So you, these two angels actually warn with one another, actually causes people to have mental health issues and not understanding what's actually going on within them. They'll actually start experiencing different mental health issues, which is a result of these two angels warn with one another. Can we go to the um, Shepherd of Hermit Mandate 6? We're going to read about the Angel of Righteousness, which is one of the angels. And then we're going to touch on the Angel of Iniquity, which is the other angel. And they're literally working against one another, speaking to you. Uh, Mandate 6, Shepherd of Hermit, chapter 2, verse 3, please. Sure. Mandate 6, Shepherd 2, verse 3. Here, saith he, and understand their workings. The angel of righteousness is delicate and bashful and gentle and tranquil. When then this one enters into thy heart, forthwith he speaketh with thee of righteousness, of purity, of holiness, of contentment. And of contentment. Of every righteous deed and of every glorious virtue. When all these things enter into thy heart, Know that the angel of righteousness is with thee. These then are the works of the angel of righteousness. Trust him, therefore, and his works. Trust him, therefore, and his works. So when this angel is speaking to you, these are the ways that it operates. These are the things it brings forth. These are the fruits that it brings forth. All right. Now, let's see when it comes to the angel of wickedness, what spirit is it operating in and what does it bring forth in a person go ahead brother Cuthbert. we're at um chapter 2 verse 4 chapter 2 verse 4 now see the works of the angel of wickedness also first of all he is quick tempered and bitter and senseless and his works are evil overthrowing the servants of allah I am. whenever then he entereth into thy heart Know him by his works. How I shall discern him, sir, I reply, I know not. Listen, saith he, when a fit of angry temper or bitterness comes upon thee, know that he is in thee. Then the desires of much business and the costliness of many viands and drinking bouts and of many drunken fits and of various luxuries which are unseemly and the desire of women and avarice, and haughtiness, and boastfulness, and whatsoever things are akin and like to these. Hold on, Casa. I want you to go back. It says, when a fit of angry temper or bitterness comes upon thee, know that he is in thee. Right? Yes. So, if the angel of wickedness is in you, and Yache is knocking at the door, What's happening? Somebody else is already there. Right. And I can't hear his voice because I'm listening to the angel of wickedness. Right. They're not on the same team. Right. So you have an enemy within your temple, but yet Yache is outside. So you can see the dichotomy of having that enemy in you. And that enemy wants to blind you from even recognizing Yahweh's voice. He wants to blind you, and that's why a lot of people go into um, like they're they're blinded, like they can't see their faults, they can't see the things that they do wrong, because the only way to stay in it is to be blinded. And that pride that comes with the angel of iniquity blinds a person from being able to see their own faults and turning from them. That's why when we were reading in Revelations, he was like, I would that you would repent. I would that you would actually want to put on these garments to be tried in that fire. I'd rather you put on these white garments so that you can actually start seeing 
the things that's going on within you. Um, brother, you mind starting back um, where it says when a fit of angry temper? I want to read that again. Sure. Uh, if I may add, in Go ahead. the scripture support what you're relaying because Testament of Dan is speak on how the spirit of anger, it blinds the mind and the angel of wickedness works in a fit of angry temper and bitterness. And from Dan showing anger blinds the mind and sorrow from Hermas shows that it takes us away from the Holy Spirit. So these things truly hinder us with the mental illnesses that we face, like depression, sorrow, anxiety. They hinder us from being able to hear. We got angry temper. Dan mentioned that it causes us not to hark into the voice of a prophet. Mm -hmm. so Don't forget bipolar. Yes. We wouldn't be able to hear Yache because these spirits by this angel of wickedness is working in us. Yes, indeed. And we're going to touch on a lot of that too. We, we just now getting started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, Brother Kasa. Verse 5. When a fit of angry temper or bitterness comes upon thee, know that he is in thee. Then the desire of much business and the costliness of many viands and drinking bouts and of many drunken fits and of various luxuries which are unseemly and the desire of women and avarice and haughtiness and boastfulness and whatsoever thing are akin and like to these. When then these things enter into thy heart, know that the angel of wickedness is with thee. Now, there's something I want everybody to see. If you didn't catch it already. As soon as it says. The angry temper and bitterness comes upon you. Then know that he is in thee. After that it says. Then the desire of much business. The costliness of many viands. And drinking bouts. And of many drunken fits. And of various luxuries. Which are unseemly. And the desire of women. And avarice. All of those things have to do with contentment. All of those things have to do with being covetous. Much business. It's covetous. Costliness of many viands. Covetous. Drinking bouts. Covetous. You're drinking a lot. Excessively. Many drunken fits. Various luxuries. Which are unseemly because it's covetous and desire of women you get lustful which is covetous all of those things have to do with contentment so you can see how important contentment is when it comes to actually warding off the angel of iniquity or the angel of wickedness contentment is powerful we're, we're, we're getting into it i hope y'all are listening um when then these things enter into thy heart, know that the angel of wickedness is with thee. So you wouldn't be able to hear a prophet. You wouldn't be able to hear Yache at the knocking at the door because you're so consumed with the angel of wickedness. And it has a place in you. In, the angel of wickedness is in your heart. So that's why your works become evil because the righteous angel has no place in you to lead you to Yache because that's the whole point of the righteous angel and the angel of iniquity. They're both supposed to lead you somewhere. The angel of righteousness leads you to Yache. The angel of wickedness leads you to the devil. They're both operating as entities for one side or the other. So if you are actually operating with the angel of righteousness, you would then learn Yache's voice. You will open the door for him because you're acclimated to his works. So you will know him because you know the works of the spirit of him. Whereas if you're operating in the spirit of the angel of wickedness, you don't know his works. They're foreign to you. So you're, you're not accustomed to it. You're like, okay, that's strange. I don't really know what's going on there, but I know this. 
and it leads you further down the rabbit hole. Brother Costa, you had something? Everything this we've been taught to serve the angel of wickedness in our life. Oh, yeah, definitely. This is all the lust of the world. The desire of much business, costliness of many viands, which is foods, um, drinking bouts, so we want to party, and various luxuries to live it up. And these things are unseemly because it's against the commandments. And desire for women, avarice, which is a greedy desire for wealth and material gain, mm -hmm. and haughtiness and boastfulness, then we can get and show everybody what we got or what we've done. Hence, we have social media for all of that. It's <laughs> We've been taught to serve the angel that will not help us get to Yache in this world. All right. I think that's the I think that's the point of the world in yeah. all in all honesty. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> all right. Now since we understand the work of both the angels and how the angel of wickedness attacks contentment specifically, it attacks other things, but very specifically contentment. Let's be admonished about the real life effects of its works. Uh, can we jump over to Psalms chapter ten, verse two, brother Casa? We're gonna we're gonna read there. We're gonna sure. We're gonna, we're gonna walk through this. Psalms ten and two. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Now, this is real life scenarios. We're gonna bring it down to modern day understanding, right? The wicked in his pride do is persecute the poor. And now, a lot of people would be like, man, that don't really apply to me. But operating with the angel of wickedness insinuates the pride, and other people become targets. Like, even if you're not doing it on purpose, it happens. So, because a lot of us, we have our conversation filled with covetousness. Like we're trying, we're, we're looking for something, we're trying to gain, we're trying to get ahead, we're trying to climb, whatever the case is. We're looking for something in the conversation or we're looking to see what we can get. Or if we hear something, we're like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that, uh, that, that'd that beneficial to me. In the midst of conversation, if something just sparks up. Now, if a person is looking at everybody for gain and if that person sees no profit for themselves in that other person, it becomes not worth your time. And those are the people that kind of fall away. But the people that you feel give you some type of um, benefit, those are the people you, you stick with. And you do it unaware, but you still fall into it. Uh, let's keep on reading, Brother Coffin. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. So, as they say, you reap what you sow. Your intention with others is the same thing that's going to come back to you. So, if that's the way that your, your eyes are seen, that's why he says when your eye is single, because a single man only sees one way. But the double-minded see two ways. So a single-minded person's only going to say, hey, I'm having a, a sincere conversation with you because I want to have a conversation with you because I care about you. Whereas a double-minded person is like, okay, I care about you, but also I'm looking to see what I can gain. And that's where we fall into the snare of not being content. Can we continue reading, Brother Costa? Chapter 10, verse 3 of Psalms. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom Ahaya abhorreth. Now, here we go again. We're going to take this to modern day, okay? Because I know sometimes the way the scriptures talk, it doesn't really seem like it applies to the mass of people that it actually does apply to. So, the sign to show who Elohim is referring to and also to self-examine for yourself. 
If a person is always talking about what they want in life, right? Or what they're going to get or where they're going to be in life. Like they will always talk about it in both of it. Like I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to. Gotcha. Right. It's a clear distinction of what spirit they're operating in. They have an affinity toward others of the same spirit. So when other people are boasting about what they're doing and what they got going on and stuff like that, or what they're, what they're working on or whatever the case is, they have an affinity toward other people like that because it's like, okay, that person driven, that person that's inspiring me when that person is boasting too. That person is not operating in the spirit of contentment either. So your spirit just cleave to it. And they're both walking in covetousness because they're not waiting on Elohim. They're not looking for Elohim's will upon their life. Like, okay, whatever Elohim has me to do, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing right now until Elohim shows me what else he wants me to do. You see the, the different mindsets because a single eye person, they're going to keep their eyes set on Elohim. Always. Cause it's making me, I'm, I think I'm about to jump down, man. <laughs> I need that scripture up. If you don't mind yeah, going to I it, get, we'll, we'll, I we'll. got you. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the Visica, chapter four, verse two to three. The single-minded man coveteth not gold. He overreacheth not his neighbor. He longeth not after manifold dainties. He delighteth not in varied apparel. He doth not desire to live a long life, but only waiteth for the will of Allah Hayyam. The single-minded man. So the single-minded man, he's not looking for money. He's not overreaching his neighbor. I mean, that he's not um, stepping upon his neighbor to get up the ladder. He long is not after manifold dainties. He doesn't have a desire to be rich or to have a lot of things. He delight if not in varied apparel. So he's just like, man, clothes are clothes. Give me some clothes that keep me warm. He wants, <laughs> he, he wants things that are useful. It's not about, oh, it's designer or whatever the case is. It's, oh, that's a nice shirt. It's going to keep me warm. And he doesn't have a desire to live a long life. He just wants to do what Allah wants him to do. And whatever Allah will is for him, he accepts it. And he walks in it. And this is how we have to be. We have to keep that mind so that Allah would be pleased with us. And that, that contentment will actually keep us from going off into a snare and going and stumbling somewhere or going off the path from the left hand or to the right. If we actually keep what he has shown for us to do and to keep that contentment, it actually strengthens us in our walk. Kasa, can we jump back over to um, uh, Psalms 10 and 4? Yes, sir. Uh, Psalms 10 and 4. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after Allah Hayyam. Allah Hayyam is not in all his thoughts. All right. So she or he, if they're high-minded and walking in self-will, which is the opposite of a servant in humility. So you can see that pride. And of course, you can see a pride in one's countenance because it's the way they carry themselves. You can see the pride within on the outside. And it causes them not to seek after Allah because they're already operating and the angel of wickedness is in their heart. So you can see the pride which causes them not to open the door or hear the voice of Yahweh either or the angel of righteousness. That's why it says Allah is not in all his thoughts because he becomes lukewarm. As it said in Revelations. Um, continue, Brother Castle. Chapter 10, verse 5. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, 
he puffeth at them. Now, this one's interesting. His ways are always grievous. Now, anything that he does, it becomes hard because pride. You know, if anybody, we've all had instances where we're dealing with somebody who's prideful. And, of course, some of us, we have to examine ourselves to make sure we're not walking in that pride or being this person. But their ways are grievous. That means that it's hard. Like, because of their pride, they don't want to listen. So somebody could be actually telling them a better way to do something, but they won't listen because they want to do it the way that they want to do it. And it becomes very hard for them, although it could have been simple and easy. Right. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> difficult to work together. Right. You can't work with an angel of righteousness. How can you work with your fellow man? Right. So his ways are always grievous, and the highest judgments are far above out of his sight because it doesn't make sense. Like, I got to keep the commandments. Like, if a person's walking in pride, you want them to keep ordinances and commandments that restrain them, it doesn't really go together. And as for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. And the reason he puffed at them is through that pride because he feels that he can't be touched or she can't be touched. And if we continue reading, it's going to actually go into it. Um, keep on going, Brother Kasa. Chapter 10, verse 6. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. So I ain't nobody, can't nobody touch me. I can't be moved. You can't touch me. So I, I'm puffing at you. I'm, I'm bucking at you. Like, there's nothing you're going to do about it. For well, I shall never be in adversity. And that's the mindset. I'm never going to be in adversity. I'm never going to fall. Go ahead, Brother Cosmo. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Now, this is interesting because... If his conversation is led by covetousness, she or he cannot be trusted because you don't know what they're actually trying to get from you or how they're maneuvering. Now, that's why it says his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud because you can't trust them because they're not sincere. They're not single-eyed. They're double-minded and always looking to fulfill some desire of their own. And that's what makes them dangerous because you don't know what they have need of. So you really, you really can't, you really don't know the person. And that's why it talks about deceit because you really don't know them. You can't know them because you don't know what they have need of. And if they're a person that's really not content and they're very covetous, they have need of everything. So anything that they can get out of you, they're going to take it. So for us, we have to be full of that contentment. We have to be content in all things and we have to do it according to the scriptures so that it'll save us and keep us from any spirit further taking us away from the doctrine of Yache. Brother Casa, can we jump over to um, Hebrews 13 and 5? I want to reference the, the scripture on our conversation being without covetousness. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now this this contentment just keeps going down further and further into a rabbit hole. It's going to go further into a rabbit hole as we keep on going through this lesson because it just gets deeper and deeper. Now, he said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he hath said, right? Now, this is Yache. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So why will he say I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
because having that lack of contentment shows that you have a lack of faith and trust in Yache. Because your self-will and that covetousness, you're actually showing that, hey, I don't feel that I have enough. I don't feel like I'm taken care of. I feel like I have to take it upon myself to get these things so that I can feel comfortable and feel complacent. You're completely omitting Yache. So this is a part of why it's so dangerous. And that's why self-will is such a dangerous thing. Because you feel you know better than Elohim. And or you place your desires above his for you. And either way, the angel of wickedness has more influence than the angel of righteousness. The angel of wickedness has more of a place in your heart and in your temple than the angel of righteousness. So we're getting further and further into this contentment to show how dangerous it is and where it actually leads a person. Um, Brother Costa, can we continue reading in Psalms where chapter 10, verse 8? Psalms chapter 10, verse 8. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. I know these these scriptures, like, without actually understanding them, it makes it very hard to understand what he's actually referring to. But, praise Isaiah. It's, he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret place to do if he murder the innocent, his eyes are privily set against the poor. Now, this is a person who's covetous, who, who is not actually operating in the spirit of contentment. She or he is an opportunist. Whenever they see an opportunity to gain, they're going to take it. Not considering the effects or the state that the other person may be put in. And usually when it refers to the poor, the poor is usually the kind, the kind people that don't really have a lot, but they're willing to give it to people. As, as we know, like people that are, are of a lower estate, they're more willing to give. And this specific person who's covetous, they're, they're not mindful. They know that the poor person is going to give and they're going to take it. Usually the poor is kind and will give you their last. And usually the covetous woman or man has more than enough. They have more than enough, but they're going to take more because they're not content. Because they have their trust in things. They have their trust in whatever their desire is. And those things, whether it be what they like to do, or whether it be items or whatever the case is, this is a general sense of contentment because it goes into all facets. That woman or man will continue to be an opportunist in all scenarios. So just like modern day, you can see how even the state of women, they're very, very opportunistic. Um, if they see that they can get something out of a man, they're going to take it. If they see they can get meals from him, they're going to take them. Although they may not like him, they're going to take the meal. Or they're going to take him buying stuff or taking on trips or whatever the case is because of what it talks here in Psalms. Of how a person that's covetous is going to operate. And you can see that covetousness in society today. And it's overtaking people. Uh, go ahead and keep reading, Brother Casa. Psalm chapter 10, verse 9. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. Verse 10. He croucheth and humbleth himself 
that the poor may fall by his strong ones. I hope y'all are paying attention. Now, I say he lieth and wait as a lion in his den, and he's catching the poor, right? Because he, she or he that's covetous, they're literally, they're going to catch people because usually because of whatever they're doing, whatever they, they have that's gainful for women is probably their beauty. For men, it's probably their money because they're already covetous and they're, they got a lot of money so they can continue using the money to catch more people to make more money and so on and so forth. It's a cycle because that's what they have their trust in. It says, um, he crouches and humbleth himself. This is the part that's really important. That the poor may fall by his strong ones. Now, we know how Allah speaks. Strong ones. Why would it not just say, he crouches and humbles himself that the poor may fall by him? It says strong ones. So now, now we know that it's multiple entities at work. It's not just the person. Because the word strong ones means numerous. So it's not just one entity. So now we can see that there's other evil spirits that have attached to the woman or man. And now they're not operating on their own. They're operating in multiple spirits that are actually leading and counseling them. So we can see how the angel of wickedness actually has its place and how when it speaks about um, in Matthew, how it brings more spirits than just its own, you start picking up all the spirits of wickedness that comes in dumping. Right. He's an angel, so he's a messenger. Right. Speaking on behalf of the other spirits of wickedness. So now you're inhabited by more than just not being content. Now you're inhabited by pride. Now you're inhabited by, uh, uh, we, we could just go on. <laughs> <laughs> the list, all the things he comes with, avarice, lust, deceit, feigning themselves to be humble. All the works of the flesh, pretty much. Yeah. Um, all right, let's continue, Brother Casa. Verse 11. He hath said in his heart, Elohim hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. And at the end of it all, that person becomes convinced or blinded, or the spirit or the veil of deceit comes upon them that Allah can't see anything. And that's the only way that they can stay in it is the evil spirits have to deceive you first to stay where they are. So you see the veil of deceit being placed upon the person to keep the angels of wickedness in control of the temple. They have to be able to control the inside because it's okay if Yahweh is on the outside as long as he's not on the inside with them. And we know the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell with evil spirits. So she's not going to be in there. She's going to be on the outside with Yahweh. So you see what's going on. You're allowing all these evil spirits to inhabit you. And Yahweh is knocking at the door. So we see the veil of deceit that Allah can't see anything when a person is gone operating in these spirits. But we know that Ahaya sees everything. Yeah. And nothing is hid from his face. So we, us being believers and us who are truly seeking to walk in the right way, we have to be careful what spirits we're listening to and allowing to operate in us. 
Brother Costa, can we jump over to Second Peter chapter two, verse nine? Yes, sir. Second Peter chapter two, verse nine. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the pious out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So the Lord knows how to deliver us. Ahia knows how to deliver us out of every temptation. If we want to be delivered. If a person has the right intentions and heart, the Lord always makes a way to get out of a situation. Whether you have to be patient and wait for the opportunity or something happens and he allows you to find your way out of it. If you really want to get out of a, a situation, wait on Allah and he'll deliver you because that's what he does. And that's what he said he's going to do. And I can attest for it because he does it for me all the time. And he also can suffer an unjust person to live, hoping that they would change their ways. He can allow their days to be prolonged. That's why it says, and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. But his intention is not to allow you to live long so that you can make it to the day of punishment. His intention is that you will actually repent. Uh, can we go to Wisdom of Solomon chapter 11, verse 23 and 24? Yes, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 11, verse 23. For thou hast mercy upon all, for thou canst do all things, and winkest at the sins of men, because they should amend. Because they should amend. Because they should amend means that they would repent or turn from their ways. Go ahead, Brother Casa. For thou lovest all the things that are, and abhorrest nothing which thou hast made, for never wouldest thou have made anything if thou hadst hated it. So Allah didn't create any person because he hated them. Men choose the way that they're going to go. But Allah created everybody because he loves us. And he wants us to choose the right path. But everybody can make their own decisions. We all have that ability to choose. There's a verse in the Apocalypse of Paul that confirms that him extending our lives is to give us opportunity to repent, not for the sake of actually wanting to judge us. In Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 4, it says, For indeed the Son, the great light, often addressed the Lord, saying, Lord Allah Almighty, I look upon the impieties and injustices of men, Permit me, and I shall do unto them what are my powers, that they may know that thou art Allah, I am alone. And there came a voice saying to him, I know all these things, for mine eye sees and ears hears, but my patience bears with them until they should be converted and repent. But if they do not return to me, I will judge them all. So... Scriptures confirm it's with good intent that he extends our lives. Amen. Amen. All right, let's understand self-will. Um, can you get the definition for self-will, Brother Casa, please? Sure, I can. Self-will, G829 out of the Greek. Self-pleasing, that is, arrogant, self-willed. Now you see how arrogance and self-will go together? Self-pleasing, so that means that they do things that makes them happy. They do things that makes them feel a certain type of way, or, or they do things that um, makes them feel whole. That is arrogant because an arrogant person doesn't think about anybody else when they make a decision. And a lot of times when self-will comes into the picture, that person is very, very single-minded, but not in a good way. They're choosing to do something that may impact somebody else harshly or badly. But 
in that moment, it's about their own self-pleasing. It's about their exactly as it says, self-will, self-pleasing. Um, can we jump back to Second Peter, chapter two, verse ten, please? Sure. Second Peter, chapter two, verse ten. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. All right. I wanted to go over the definition of self-will so that we can understand the verse um, prior to. Um, when it's talking about governments, it's not talking about the world government. It's talking about the heavenly government. It's talking about Allah and his law and what he set forth. Okay. Them that walk after the flesh of uncleanness and despise government. So when you're walking under the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, you can't keep those things that are holy. You can't keep those things that are righteous because you're not hearkening to the angel of righteousness. Right? Presumptuous are they. So they're very presumptuous in their works. They're self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So the things that are right, things that are righteous, they're not afraid to speak evil of things that are good and righteous. So they all have something to say about somebody that is trying to do something right or is trying to change. So you can see that spirit working. Right? So it's very hard for them to succumb to the law or to the fruits of the spirit. Right, the things that we've been instructed to do. So, if any of us find that we're getting on somebody for trying to change or getting on to somebody for trying to do the right thing, then you know, hey, I need to examine myself because you see the spirit that's working. Uh, let's continue, Brother Casa. Verse 11. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusations against them before the Lord. Now, seeing that man were the lesser and that even the angels is actually talking about how the angels operate. Also, this actually corroborates that when he's talking about governments, he's not talking about the worldly government. He's actually talking about his order of the heavens while also showing the mercy that the angels walk in toward us even being the lesser because they're not bringing relevant accusations against us they actually are full of mercy and compassion toward us in all the things that we do wrong but they're not just going out behind him oh he did this and this he did that and that no and that's the way that we're supposed to be operating we're not supposed to be bringing relevant accusations against one another operating in that spirit trying to down one another, but more so trying to help one another to grow, help one another to prosper, to move forward, to overcome. So even in that, it, it really helps us to understand how we're supposed to operate and how that contentment of just having that single eye will help us in our walk. Uh, can we continue, Brother Casa? Sure. Verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, I pray everybody's listening. Okay. There's some very specific parts. Um, it said, they speak evil of things that they understand not. And this is one of the things that we have to be very, very careful of not doing. That if we don't understand something, it doesn't give us the right to not do it. And that's part of contentment and not operating in self-will. Because if Allah instructs us to do something, we have to be able to do it and not say, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to do it. And especially for women and their husbands, 
if the husband asked them to do something, they can't say, I don't want to do it because I don't understand it. You see how that spirit, everything kind of starts coming back and it's the same self-will of not being content with who Allah I am place you with to lead and guide you and also the will of Allah I am itself because we have to be content with his will upon our lives because that's where the self will comes from is that you're not content with the will of Allah I am upon your life so you may feel that you know better or that you know a better way or that you're right and you might justify it in your mind just because you don't understand it you may find a way to justify it for yourself that whatever you're doing that's not according to what was commanded or told you that you will find a justification for why you're doing the right thing although you're not doing what was commanded and that's when you start falling into that self-will from the lack of contentment. Now, we're supposed to be good servants, right? So we can't allow that self-will to destroy us because we don't understand something, but instead being a good servant and keeping the charge laid unto us, believing that it is for our own good because Allah wouldn't place anything upon us that was going to hurt us. But a lot of times it's us that choose a different path that ends up hurting us because of our double mind. All right? And we can't walk in our own understanding. That's another thing that leads us down another path that is not helpful for us in our walk in Yache. You got anything, Brother Casa, before we keep reading? Um, no, sir. All right. Uh, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13, please. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots are they and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Hmm. So you can see how everything is coming back to not being content. Because the opposite of content is covetous. So they have eyes full of adultery and they can't cease from sin because just like we talked about contentment, contentment, it's in all facets of life. You know, a, a lot of times we look at contentment as far as just like money or um, when it comes to material things, but contentment is in our walk. Contentment is in our thoughts. Contentment is in our heart. And these are the things that we actually have to be aware of and actually have to grow in. Because to cease from sin, it takes contentment. Like, I know that's wrong, and I'm good with what I'm doing. I'm good with what Allah is asking me to do. I'm content with that. I don't feel like I need more. I don't feel like I need to do this because of my covetousness or because I want it or I desire it. Or desire to be seen in the sight of men or to please men. To be content that I'm doing this because it's right to Allah I am. And being content with it. And if we continue in that way, we become cursed children. Because we're covetous. When we're operating in that spirit, we can't serve Allah Hayyam because we can't keep his law. We can't bear the fruits of the spirit because we want everything. 
That's why we become lukewarm. That's why we read the scripture in Revelations at the very beginning. It's because we become a lukewarm person because we're not content with one side or the other. That's why he said, I would rather you choose to be hot or cold. Choose contentment in this or just go ahead and do what you're going to do with all your desires. Because if you're cold, then... You know, you know, like we can, we can, we can, we can do something. We can, we can make something happen. And you're hot, like you're all over the place. That's interesting. He said, "Hot or cold, you can be inflamed with idols." What the scriptures explain how these spirits is a group, is a collection, all right? On one side, or we can grow cold to the lust of the world. Okay. and we don't want to be cursed children that's not where we want to end up so we have to put on the armor yache. we have to fight against evil spirits the evil spirits that are trying to lead us with what we think are our own desires because as we read before it's actually the angel of wickedness that's actually implanting these desires in our heart and in our mind so we feel like they're our own but really, they're not. So we have to be very, very aware and on guard as to what spirit is trying to lead us and where it's trying to lead us. And when we learn of Alahayim and learn of his spirit and how his spirit operates in us and around us, then we have to learn to be content in that, not trying to go outside of it. Brother Casa, can we read the rock chapter 10, verse 6? Yes, sir. Sirach 10 and 6. Bear not hatred to thy neighbor for every wrong, and do nothing at all by injurious practices. Right. So be not spiteful. Right? Now, a lot of us are learning, and even in being spiteful, contentment has a part to play there's actually two things that have a part to play in being spiteful and one is contentment and one is pride because your desire to be respected in most cases your desire to be respected and or treated how you feel someone's supposed to treat you actually ends up affecting you in this because you're not content to the will of Allah that things may come upon you and it's from him to teach you or to help you grow and at the same time the pride comes in because you feel it's supposed to be another way so you can see how one would get spiteful it's like okay you're treating me you're not treating me the way I want to be treated so I have a problem with you not understanding that it was Allah that actually caused it to happen for your own growth and knowing that now let's give an example right can you imagine let's say let's say jacob jacob and laban when laban was treating jacob badly right and let's say that jacob started acting spiteful toward laban how would that have played out? Now, Jacob was content. Jacob dwelt with Laban. He was content with Laban. And he even was content with Alahayim to the point where Laban was doing him wrong, but yet he had his trust in Alahayim. Now, if Jacob wouldn't have been content and his pride would have came in or pride would have came in and Jacob would have lost that contentment with Alahayim and then started operating in pride toward Laban, it would have been a completely different scenario. All right. Now we continue reading in Sirach chapter 10, verse seven. He's going to go into pride because that's the part of spiteful that's a problem 
He's gonna go into actually both of them. Go ahead, brother Cosmo. So uh, ten and seven. Pride is hateful before Allahim and man, and by both doth one commit iniquity. And here's why. Go ahead, brother Cosmo. Because of unrighteous dealings, injuries, and riches gotten by deceit, the kingdom is translated from one people to another. So you can see it's pride. And then it says, because of unrighteous dealings, which we know that comes from being covetous, injuries, which is the cause of the covetousness because you injure people, you hurt people, and riches got by deceit, which is from being covetous. All right, and for that reason, the kingdom is translated from one people to another. And that has multiple facets. Every time our kingdom fell, it was because of pride and lack of contentment. A lot of times. And even how the Gentiles got grafted in, it's because of pride and covetousness, lack of contentment. So I hope everybody is seeing and able to see how we can learn from even our foreparents and their downfalls that we cannot make the same mistake again and really see how important contentment is. Can we continue in uh, Sirach 10 and 9, Brother Kasa? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Sirach chapter 10, verse 9. Why is earth and ashes proud? There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. Such an one setteth his soul to sail, because while he liveth, he casteth away his bows. So you can see, if we would have read Sirach chapter 10, verses 6 through 9, you would have seen he was talking about pride and covetousness. Right? And those two things were the things that caused us to get into so much trouble. He said, why is earth and ashes proud? He's talking about us because we were made, we were formed from the dust and so forth. There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. Right. And as we're reading, we're seeing why. Because it's it's so hard to trust them. And we want to be trusted. We want to be trustworthy. That's actually what we're actually commanded to be is trustworthy. So we can't have a lack of contentment and being trustworthy. Because the contentment is supposed to be a part of our character. We're supposed to walk in it. We're supposed to talk in it. We're supposed to think in it. It's supposed to be in our heart. So we have to change. We have to grow in that contentment and do all things unto Yache. If we're not here to live for him, what are we living for? And that's a, a great question for all of us to ask ourselves. What are we living for if we're not here to live for him? If we're not here to do his will, what will are we here to do? So it's something to think about, something to ponder on. Can we read Sirach 14 and 3? Sure. And we're going we're gonna to go down into that. Okay. Sirach 14 and 3. Riches are not comely for a niggard. And what should an envious man do with money? Can we get the definition of niggard? A niggard is an objectively ungenerous, stingy. Right. So he's ungenerous and stingy, so that everybody can understand what they're referring to. It's an ungenerous man or a stingy man, All right? So it's saying riches are not comely for ungenerous or stingy person. So if a person is stingy, riches aren't helping him in his walk. All right. And what can an envious man do with money? Because it's never going to be enough. 
it ends up being a snare to them. All right. Go ahead, Brother Cotton. Can we read Sirach 14 and 4, please? Yes, sir. Verse 4. He that gathereth by defrauding his own soul gathereth for others that shall spend his good riotously. So he gathers by defrauding his own soul. He's lying to himself so that he can lie to other people. So it becomes more of a snare to him than a help. That's exactly why it reads what it reads in Surah 14 and 5. He that is evil to himself, to whom will he be good? He shall not take pleasure in his goods. So he's evil to himself because he lies to himself. He lies to himself so that he can get what he wants or that he can convince himself that it's okay. And that's why it's so important as Psalm 15 speaks about, about a man that speaks the truth in his heart. Because we have to want to see these things. We have to want to see our errors to be able to see it. If we lie to ourselves, we're not going to see it and we're going to stay where we are. And that's what the evil spirits want. They want us to lie to ourselves so that we don't see it. Because the more that we don't see it, the more it can operate because it has no pushback. There's no angel of righteousness you're not able to hear. Just like it said, Yache is knocking at the door and you can't hear his voice. You can't hear the angel of righteousness that's trying to give you understanding of, hey, that's not good for you. But instead, you're gun ho on the thing that is not good for you because you don't know no other way. And that's exactly what it wants. It wants to keep you in that place. All right, go ahead. There's none worse than he that envieth himself. And this is a recompense of his wickedness. So there's none worse than he that envieth himself. So you can't see past yourself. And that's exactly what self-will does. Self-will blinds the woman or the man not to see past themselves because they're only looking for their own self-pleasure. So that contentment is very, very important for anyone that struggles with self-will or anyone that struggles with being covetous or any of these things that we've spoken about. Contentment, contentment, contentment. Uh, keep going, Brother Casa. Verse 7. And if he doeth good, he doeth it unwillingly. Now, that means that he does it by mistake. <laughs> so, either the angel of righteousness inhabits him for a moment, and it's Allah will upon him that he did something because Allah ordained it, because it's in um, Separate Hermes, it says that he does some good, but that person usually is not intentional because they're they're looking for gain all the time. They're looking for their own their own gain. They're looking for what they can get out of something, and if it just so happens that you gain too, then it just so happens. Keep going, Brother Casa. And at the last, he will declare his wickedness. And at the last, his true intentions always come out. Go ahead. Verse 8. The envious man hath a wicked eye. He turneth away his face and despiseth men. A covetous man's eye is not satisfied with his portion, and the iniquity of the wicked drieth up his soul. And that's where we want to stay away from. We don't want to not be satisfied with our portion that Allah has given unto us. Go ahead. That's why Paul said, them that compare themselves amongst themselves are not wise. Mm -hmm. Verse 10. Mm -hmm. A wicked eye envieth his bread, 
and he is a niggard at his table. Right. So he's stingy, right? So he don't want to share. You know, you see a lot of people, they don't want to share their food or whatever the case is or whatever it is that they have. They don't want to share. They're stingy. You can see that lack of contentment. It plays in so many facets. It's amazing. Go ahead. My son, according to thy ability, do good to thyself and give the Lord his due offering. Mm -hmm. Remember that death will not be long in coming and that the covenant of the grave is not showed unto thee. Do good unto thy friend before thou die and according to thy ability, stretch out thy hand and give to him. Now he's telling us what we can do to help us with contentment, to help us with that covetousness. All right, knowing that we all are going to die, right? But he said, do good before you die. And according to thy ability, stretch out thy hand and give unto him. Like, do good to people, right? Continue, Katha. Defraud not thyself of the good day, and let not the part of a good desire overpass thee. All right. So don't defraud yourself of a good day, because we all have another day to live. Take advantage of the day that we have to live and do good, right? And don't let a good desire overpass you. So when that angel of righteousness actually, you actually hear them for that moment, make sure you do it. So you can actually start practicing to do good things and not just for your own desire or just to get something out of it. Do it from sincerity. Go ahead. He goes on to say, Thou not leave thy travails unto another, and thy labors to be divided by lot? And give and take, and sanctify thy soul, for there is no seeking of dainties in the grave. Right. So covetousness doesn't profit you when you die. Go ahead. All flesh waxeth old as a garment, for the covenant from the beginning is, thou shalt die the death. So there's no getting around dying. Go ahead. As of the green leaves on a thick tree, some fall and some grow, so is the generations of flesh and blood, one coming to an end and another is born. The cycle of life. Every work rotteth and consumeth away, and the work of thereof shall go with all. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man that doth meditate good things in wisdom, and that reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. Blessed is the man that doeth meditate good things and wisdom. Right? They're literally learning the ways of wisdom. They're reading. They're meditating on these things, on the good things of Allah. And that reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. So he sits there and thinks about the holy things, what Allah says, and, and finds out why they're good. He reasoneth of holy things by his understanding. So he's trying to figure out why is that good. Figure out why the things that Allah tells us to do are good. Instead of being so negative and so dismissive or 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 resistant. resistant thank you. Or resistant, but actually coming to it and saying, you know what, why is that good? Looking it up, saying, okay, all right. He doesn't want us to eat pork. Okay, why? Oh, this, 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 and this. It's 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 hurting the body. Okay, all right, that's good. Reason. Go ahead, brother. He that considereth her ways in his heart shall also have understanding in her secrets. He that considereth her ways. So now we're talking about the Holy Spirit when it said, uh, bless the man that doeth meditate good things in wisdom of course we know wisdom chakoma is the holy spirit he that consider of her ways in his heart to also have understanding in her secrets so when you consider the ways of righteousness the holy spirit actually starts helping you go ahead go after her as one that traces and lie in wait in her ways All right. seek after her go ahead he that prieth in at her windows shall also hearken at her doors. All right. 
So you, you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional to follow after the Holy Spirit. Right? And you have to learn of her. Search the scriptures. We have videos about the Holy Spirit. Go and check those videos out and actually learn how she operates and what she does and what she brings forth and, and, and you know, and what she looks for, you know, in a person. So you can start operating that way so that she will actually be with you. Go ahead, Brother Casa. He that doth lodge near her house shall also fasten a pin in her walls. Hmm. He shall pitch his tent nigh unto her and shall lodge in a lodging where good things are. He shall set his children under her shelter and shall lodge under her branches. So your children will be well too. If you find her, it'll help the children too because she'll operate in you to help teach the children. Go ahead. By her he shall be covered from heat, and in her glory shall he dwell. Amen. Now Paul gave a great insight on how to walk in contentment and staying focused on the will of Elohim. Even Paul himself had to learn this to incorporate it in his walk in his life as well. Uh, can we go to Philippians chapter 4 verse 11? Yes, sir. 13, please. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So Paul said, whether Elohim wants me to have more at a, at a particular moment, or whether he wants me to have less at a particular moment, I learn to be content with no matter where I am, focusing in on the will of Elohim, and knowing that he can do all things through Yahweh who strengthens him, whether it's he needs to be poor for a moment, or whether he needs to be rich to do whatever will it is of Elohim that he needs to do in that particular season. And we're supposed to have that same faith in Yahche as well, that we can do all things no matter if we're poor or no matter if we're rich, that we have to be content no matter what is going on in our life. No matter where Elohim has us in that particular moment. All right. Now, we also have to be careful who we're esteeming as righteous leaders as well, because we can't take counsel and guidance from everyone, but instead those that are walking in the faith of Yache. For true servants teach good things to edify, so we all have to watch what spirit we're walking in towards one another. Uh, can we go to 1 Timothy 6 and 2, please? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. And they that have believed in masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not unto wholesome words, even the words of our Lord, Yahshua Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to holiness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is holiness, from such withdraw thyself. So you can see, even when it comes to people that are supposed to be serving, when we say servants, we mean people that are supposed to be helping the people, um, you have to watch for that contentment as well. Because if they're operating in that same covetous spirit, then you literally are going to fall and be led away at some point as well. That's why it says, supposing that gain is holiness, um, we have to stay away from things like that because it doesn't matter how much you have or where you are as far as stature in your life. That's not what Elohim is looking for. You know, we went through the scriptures. I'm sure everybody is getting very familiar with it now. Um, Brother Casa. But holiness 
with contentment is great gain. Amen. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. That's the wall that we need, the barrier that we need to create. We have food, we have raiment. Anything else is a plus from Alahayim. Okay. Jacob earlier, everything was taken from him, remember? Oh, you're talking about Jacob? Yeah, you had spake on him earlier with Laban. Right. And of course, we're discussing all these things, and it's always nice to have some uh, the solutions <laughs> as well right. as understanding the problem. <laughs> Jacob, after everything was taken, all his riches was taken, and he was left with just his staff. And he said, if Allah would provide for me, I would, he would be my Allah Hayyam. You You and broke up. What did you say? If Allah would provide what? I'm going to, I want to get the scripture, Kyle. He has, says, I think he said food and raiment. Go ahead. Go find it if you can get it. <laughs> Genesis 28 and 20. So Jacob vowed a vow saying, if Allah will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my Allah mm. And you see that wall kept him to go through everything he went through by that contentment. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Food and raiment. If I get those two things, everything else is a bonus. Like, just being simplistic, like, mentally, spiritually, like, and sowing those things in our heart, like, it, it, it makes it hard for any spirit to lead us astray because we're so content with so little. Right. Let's learn about the benefits of contentment. Um, let's go to Sirach chapter 40. We're going to start at um, verse 17. Sirach 40 and 17. Bountifulness is a most fruitful garden, and mercifulness endureth forever. To labor and to be content with that a man hath is a sweet life, but he that findeth a treasure is above them both. Mm -hmm. Children and the building of a city continue a man's name, but a blameless wife is counted above them both. Children and the building of a city continue a man's name, but a blameless wife is counted above them both. So... A woman walking in sincerity and contentment and able to hear and walking in the fruits of the spirit and the law is just a great thing. Just being content. Being content with what a man has. Just like Paul said, whether he is abased, like, like it doesn't matter. Like, He's just content with whatever Allah has given him in that season or whatever the case is. He's content in it. And it helps him in his walk, his spiritual walk. Can we jump over to Hebrews 13 and 1, please? Sure. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. And be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels in unawares. Now, can you imagine being covetous and entertaining an angel? You're having a conversation with an angel and you're covetous and they may say something that you may want, whether it be some spiritual gift or whether they're talking about gold or whatever, or just anything. I mean, we can just we can take this anywhere. You're having a conversation with an angel. And it's a stranger and you don't really know, but you're covetous and you're looking for what you can get out of them. Right. And sometimes even if you're not going in with the inclination of what you can get out of them, you may hear something and you're like, oh, I, that I, that can benefit me. 
you have to be very on guard as to who who you're entertaining and you have to do it all the time you have to you have to walk in contentment all the time because if it's for you Allah is going to give it to you you don't have to find a way to get it go ahead brother Kassam remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body all right so if anybody's going through something you go through it with them if they suffer adversity as if you suffer adversity go ahead marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers Allah will judge now that goes into contentment as well. Adultery goes into contentment because you're not content with what Allah has given unto you. All right? So marriage is honorable <clears throat> in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, Allah would judge because whoremongers and adulterers are covetous. Go ahead. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And that helps us with contentment, that mindset. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He keeps me. He gives me food and raiment. I'm content with that. He keeps me. Right? Just like Jacob said. You will be my Elohim, right? And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So as long as I have those two things, I don't need anything else. You're, you're not going to, to sway me or you're not going to get me to go off and do something that I'm not supposed to do because I'm so content already. Now, can you imagine um, if anybody is familiar with the uh, story and was it second and fourth Maccabees with the woman and her seven children? If they weren't content with Allah Hayim and what Allah Hayim had given unto them, they were offered everything from the Grecians. Riches, honor. <laughs> so it would have been a snare for them if they would have said okay i'm putting away this contentment and i'm going to take what these people got in covetousness they would have lost their salvation so i'm 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 really hoping everybody's understanding how important contentment is and how important it is to have it and to utilize it in your life um because contentment helps us with faith. Yes, sir. <laughs> Content as well. All right. Jubilees had mentioned he was tried 10 times and he was found faithful and patient in all his trials. Even when Sarah died, he stayed patient and didn't get indignant and meekly, gently asked for a place to bury his wife. He didn't get um desirous or worked up about the situation even knowing that the land of canaan was promised to him and everything he was content with everything Allah had ordained even to give up his own son he was content to do right. it yes he was we have many great examples you know, we just have to choose to be content even in this world where everybody wants so much, like it's so your your worth is decided upon how much you have or how well you're doing according to a worldly standard. Like to to be content with so little in this time, like is gonna save us. Because we're not going to care about money. So those people who aren't content, they're going to take the mark of the beast. 
because they want to be able to access money or, or access the things which they seem, which they desire. And you know, you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast when that comes. Um, many people are going to fall away because they simply can't live the life that they want to live walking in this path. Because we're going to have to flee society at some point. You're not going to be living a lavish life. You know. Like you have. To, you have to know what you're walking into. You have to know what you're preparing yourself for. Um, Brother Cox, can we finish um, Hebrews 13 and 7, please? Sure. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of Allah Hayyam, whose faith follow and sit in the end of their conversation. So when you're looking at a, a servant or someone who is over the people, helping the people and teaching them, you have to consider the end of their conversation. Where are they leading you? Where are they leading you to go? What are they leading you to do? Are they leading you toward salvation? Are they leading you to grow closer to Yache? Are they leading you to, to see things in yourself for the betterment of yourself? Or are they making you feel good? Are they just saying things that sound good, but are not fruitful? Are they operating in covetousness? Because that's not where Yache dwells. So we have these indicators to guide us on the right path. Even if you don't have all the answers, you have indicators to help you decipher what's right and what's wrong. And don't be a respecter of persons and to overlook things because it's only going to take you away from your own salvation. Now, as far as when Casa um, referred about sorrow, um, these are one of the things that you have to stay away from too. When we talked about how Allah chastens his children and he wants to make you like gold tried in the fire and he wants to make you white, have white garments and cover your nakedness, we can't go into sorrow by being corrected. Uh, can we read the Testament of Dan, chapter 4, verse 5, Brother Casa? Sure. Testament of Dan, chapter 4, verse 5. If you fall into any loss or ruin, my children, be not afflicted. For this very spirit maketh a man desire that which is perishable in order that he may be enraged through the affliction. Through the affliction. So if something happens, say you suffer loss or ruin or something happens, or you're, you're chastened for something that you may have done wrong, right? Um, don't let the spirit of sorrow cause you to, to do something after the fact that causes more damage. Because usually what happens is, is we go into that, that spirit of sorrow when we're corrected or when something doesn't go well or whatever the case is, and we go into that, I can't get it right. So I'm just going to do wrong because I can't get it right. And that spirit right there, it's one of the spirits that actually it's going to cause us to stay down when it says a righteous man falleth several times, but he get us back up. That sorrow tries to keep you down. So we have to be very on guard against that from trying to cause us not to be able to get back up and saying, hey, okay, thank you, Allah for teaching me. Thank you for showing me my fault. Now let me do it. Being encouraged, knowing that all things come from Allah And it's something that you need to learn for the sake of your salvation. Now, we know Allah can do all things, and he also makes sure we're okay. He did it before, and he'll do it again. Even in the wilderness, 
He fed us manna, but many don't know the reason behind why he fed us the manna. And we're going to get to it today. Now, this is the last scriptures we're going to go through for this lesson. But it has a great lesson here at the end to actually understand how Elohim operates toward us and why he does. Um, can we go to Wisdom of Solomon chapter 16, verse 20? And we're going to read down to 26. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 16, verse 20. Instead, whereof thou feddest thine own people with angels' food, and didst send them from heaven bread prepared without their labor, able to content every man's delight and agreeing to every man's taste. Now, he fed us angels' food, right? And it was a reason why he did it because one, it was bread prepared without our labor. Just like the kingdom is prepared without our labor. Able to content every man's delight and agreeing to every taste. It was a shadow of what was to come. Okay. So the kingdom is going to satisfy everybody's delight, no matter what you have going on, no matter what you like. The kingdom of heaven is prepared and created for that. Go ahead. For thy sustenance declared thy sweetness unto thy children, and serving to the appetite of the eater, tempered itself to every man's liking. Right. So even in the wilderness, when everybody ate the manna, the manna tasted different to everybody based off of their own personal preference. <laughs> Go ahead. But snow and ice endured the fire. And melted not, that they might know that fire burning in the hail and sparkling in the rain did destroy the fruits of the enemies. So he made sure that our enemies were destroyed and that no man could say that it wasn't Elohim that did it. They can't say it just happened by some chance. He made sure that they knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was him. But this again did even forget his own strength that the righteous might be nourished. For the creature that serveth thee, who art the maker, increaseth his strength against the unrighteous for their punishment, and abateth his strength for the benefit of such as put their trust in thee. You understand that? For the creature that serveth thee, that will be us, who art the maker, which is Elohim, increaseth his strength against the unrighteous for their punishment, and abateth his strength. So he increaseth his strength for those that want to come against us, and abateth his strength for the benefit as such as put their trust in him. So he'll humble himself for us, those that want to follow after him. Which is great humility. Verse 25, therefore, even then was it altered into all fashions and was obedient to thy grace that nourisheth all things according to the desire of them that had need. All right. So Alahayim, Alahayim is content. He operates in the spirit of contentment. Just as Paul spoke of. He's able to abase and to, what's the other word? Ab abound. abound. He's able to change based off what's needful. Go ahead, Brother Casa. And why is this? Why does he operate like this? And why did he do what he did for us in the wilderness? Go ahead, Brother Casa. That thy children, O oh Lord, whom thou lovest might know that it is not the growing of fruits that nourisheth man, but that it is thy word which preserveth them that put their trust in thee. Y'all remember at the beginning when Yahweh said in Revelations, when he was standing outside 
It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and he with me. Right? As we see in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 16, verse 26, it says, That thy children, O Lord, whom thou lovest, might know that it is not the growing of fruits that nourisheth man, but it is thy word. It's the same Yache knocking at the door, wanting you to hear his voice, which preserveth them that put their trust in thee. It's actually Yache that actually nourishes us if we put our trust in him and actually hear his voice. So to do that, we have to rid of the angel of wickedness and hearken unto the angel of righteousness so that we can actually hear his voice and that we can actually be nourished by his word. And that takes contentment. Content in Elohim in all facets. You got anything, Casa? Great edification. Um, early on with the contentment part, I thought it was interesting seeing that it's the angel of wickedness that's in us from what we've been taught and how we've been taught to operate in life. And he works with other spirits. Hence, we have the war in our mind that carries us into the mental health issues, depression, sorrow, bipolar, and so forth. Seeing how being content to serve Allah I am, Naphtali spake of being silent with purity of heart that we may know the will of Allah I am. I thought it was great that if we grow to that place where we really want to know Allah I am's will, we have guidance to know, be silent, to quiet ourselves, even in our minds, because we know if we're honest with ourselves that the angel of wickedness has been in us and leading us away. So now we sit and wait to hear from Allah Hayyam, being content that and trusting that he is going to send his word and he is going to guide us out of whatever we're experiencing within ourselves and whatever temptation we may be facing without ourselves that was really good guidance in the midst of all this mm -hmm. well we hope everybody enjoyed the lesson please if you would like to to join us for fellowship please send us an email at hebrewreaders at gmail.com um, we we gather every shabbat day at 10 25 est um, I don't know exactly the time zone for everybody's respective area, but uh, we would definitely get it to you um, if you send us an email. Uh, we thank you. We pray that the lesson helped everybody uh, in their walk and their growth. And we give glory to Ahaya and, and Yache and the Holy Spirit Wa Kodoshi for all their help and guidance toward us. Um, may the Holy Name be exalted. We thank you. We love you guys. Peace. Peace.